My name is Paul Goodwin. I'm University Chair of Black Art and Design, um, and I chair that position with um, Professor Sonia Boyce. I've been at the university for um, about just under two years. Um, I initially taught on the MA in um, curating at Chelsea College of Art, and um, now I occupy the role of Joint Chair of Black Art and Design with Sonia Boyce. I'm a, a curator, um, and I work in contemporary art. Um, particularly specialising around um, black and diasporic artist practices. The Black Art and Design, um, the Chair of Black Art and Design at UNOAL is part of the University Chairs um, and I think it is an extremely bold measure by University of the Arts to identify an area of practice um, which is the contribution of black and Asian artists um, in this country um, to, art, to contemporary art practice. And really what, the, what this position does is to acknowledge that contribution by bringing, it, bringing these practices to, into the context of the art school. There has been, um, in some respects, a lack of understanding or a lack of awareness, perhaps, about some of the incredible achievements of black and Asian artists and diasporic artists to art practice. And so what Sonia Boyce and myself are doing is bringing those practices and highlighting them in the context of the mainstream of the art school and in terms of working with various courses across the university um, to embed practices within the curriculum. So the GHOST project um, GOS, is called GHOST Technology Subjectivities and it's a curatorial research project in a way. It's a, it's a series of displays um, that take place at University of the Arts. So we've had two at Chelsea so far which focus on artworks that address questions around technology and art making practice and try to ask critical questions about, what, about the relationship between art and technology in an age of migration, um, globalisation and diasporic dispersed identities. The event tonight that we're focusing on is um, Keith Piper and Gary Stewart in conversation with myself. So, Tonight, Keith Piper will be talking about some of his pioneering work in the 1990s, such as Relocating the Remains, which was a huge, um, very important project, um, a CD-ROM, an exhibition that toured internationally, as well as an, a monograph that really looked at how um, the ghosts of the past in relation to the African diaspora, slavery, um, the trauma of the Middle Passage, etc., how those scattered remains and memories of those um, events can be recuperated, if you like. And what he does is that in, the CD, in this particular project, he, he has various themes. He takes the audience on a kind of expedition, if you like, a journey into the heart of the cultural memory of the African diaspora through various iconic um, moments. The other artist that we're talking to tonight is um, Gary Stewart. Gary Stewart is a multimedia artist, um, curator, producer, who was, um, from 1995 to 2011, the uh, head of new media at INOVA, which is the International Institute of Visual Arts. And I think this, his work was, again, quite pioneering this, in, this, in the sense that it focused on a number of culturally diverse projects um, at INOVA, which looked at the implications of art and technology and how, um, for example, issues such as power, surveillance, control, within that were hardwired in certain technological developments um, impact upon uh, people's destinations and understandings. I think for me, um, this event's important because um, the history, in the still emerging histories of new media art and, and internet art, the contribution of, uh, if you like, diasporic and um, ethnic minority practitioners is still not very well known. I mean, the, the general history itself is not very well known, and it's still emerging. But within that, I think there are other histories and projects that should be highlighted. And I think this t talk tonight will really focus on that and help to bring it into the mainstream. But I think it will also inspire a younger generation of artists who perhaps were not aware of some of these practices to do a bit more research and thinking about them. So I think um, I'm really excited about tonight. I think tonight is going to open up to new questions, hopefully, in thinking about this question of art and technology and how um, this question is often mediated through issues of power and identity.
Um, so what is GOES? What is this project that um, we've been working on? Well, it's a, it's a, it's a curatorial, it's a research project, really, um, that I'm developing with Sonia Boyce at the University of the Arts um, that features a number of key artworks from a range of artists around exploring ideas around technology, subjectivity, and contemporary art practice. The project explores how artists are interrogating these complex relationships, um, particularly in an age of migration, globalization, and scattered diaspora identities. Questions around how artists are engaging with technology, both in thematic terms and as artistic strategies and mediums, I think are becoming increasingly central to the, to, in relation to current debates in contemporary art. There's been a proliferation, a huge proliferation, of artistic projects, books, exhibitions, web-based initiatives that are really attempting to understand and articulate the meanings and effects of artistic production in what can be called a techno-cultural age. In other words, an age where technology and culture are becoming increasingly intertwined and in some respects, perhaps indistinguishable. This is the sense in which theories such as Jean Baudrillard argue, can argue that there has been, to quote, a mutation of a properly industrial society into what could be called our techno-culture. So he kind of really talks about this term, this idea that we're, mu we're mutating into a techno-culture. Um, if we accept then, tentatively, that culture is mutating into techno-culture, not everyone, of course, agrees with this. In other words, a culture characterized by the massive proliferation and circulation of images, of digital images, the proliferation of data clouds that steal our data, basically, and human machine cyborg kind of interactions, just to give a few characteristics of what we're talking about. Then if we accept this, then artists, I think, as agents and producers of culture, have a lot to say about what this techno-culture is. Some critics, such as Claire Bishop, in her influential essay, The Digital Divide, have forcefully argued that, in fact, the opposite is happening. There's actually a disavowal and a rejection of the digital, if you like, in contemporary art, as evidenced by the current fascination you know, with outmoded technology and all things analog. No exhibition is really, these days, complete, she argues, without the gently clunking carousel of a slide projector or whirring or the whirring of an eight millimeter or 16 millimeter film reel in the background somewhere, right? I mean, you go to Tate, Tate Britain and look at the Turner Prize and you'll see plenty of that. Claire, she suggests, Claire Bishop suggests that much of contemporary art is in fact hybrid in relation to its engagement with technology. The so-called digital divide in a way is just a myth. In other words, artworks are often analog in appearance but are underpinned by a digital structure or infrastructure, right, that underpins that. Nonetheless, there is, the suggestion is there that there is a kind of unease and a fear even among many contemporary artists about art's embracing of our so-called technocultural reality. So an important question thus arises that I think relates to one of the ways that I want to think about the idea of ghosts and haunting in contemporary art in relation to this project. Namely, what are these fears and unease about embracing technological mutation in our societies? What are these fears? How are outmoded, declassified, marginal mediums and technologies haunting artistic production today? And what are the traumas and ghostly excesses, in other words, the, the kind of unknowns that haunt artistic production in this way? And of course, are these traumas and fears related to forms of identity, subjectivity, and questions of representation? Another problematic that the Ghost Project seeks to address is in relation to the way that certain questions of history and memory, identity, and power have been downplayed and left to hover and fester in the dark recesses and corners of contemporary art technological imaginary. I referred earlier to this kind of huge proliferation of art historical 
in contemporary art discussion and research about the, na about the relationship between art and technology in the current technological, uh, technocultural conjuncture. However, I think there's been less research and discussion about how these important questions of technology have been addressed within the context of questions, problematics around migration, around race and post-colonialism, and the proliferation of diasporic, increasingly diasporic identities, including sexual and gender identities, particularly in the context of what's happening in Europe today. In many ways, questions of diaspora, race, and post-colonial identities are, are like ghostly presences or excesses haunting the technological utopias and techno-determinism that often pervade discussions of, around art and technology. Identity, in fact, a bit like analog media, has become outmoded and disavowed in many areas of contemporary art practice, at least on the surface, on the surface. However, a bit like Claire Bishop's digital divide, the formulation of the hybrid, you know, the formulation of the hybrid nature of many contemporary artworks, I think questions of racial, sexual, or gender identity underpin and underlay many artistic concerns, but are not always expressed in the most obvious terms. In other words, these crucial questions are like ghosts, haunting the machine of contemporary art. In the still, new, still newly emerging histories of new, new media and, and art post-internet, many questions raised about, around black and diaspora artist practices can be characterized, in my opinion, as the proverbial ghosts in the machine. Invisible, or at best marginal, in mainstream art histories, exhibitions, and collections of new media and post-internet art. Yet the works produced by these artists often ask crucial questions that haunt the spaces of contemporary art's fascination with technology, such as, what can art tell us about the transformation of gendered, class, and racialized subjectivities in our techno-cultural and information-rich societies? What does a truly critical and transformative art practice look like today? And what are the excesses that hover as ghostly spectres around forms of representation and its um, technologies? Now, much of my thinking, which is still being developed as I speak, um, literally, and I'm, tonight I think is a kind of part of the research, really. I'm really looking forward to getting the, the feedback from, from many of you guys who I say know much more about it than I do. Um, much of my thinking around this um, um, and, um, comes really from my fascination for quite a while now um, with, one of the, with the practice of one of the speakers tonight, Keith Piper. Yes, Keith, you. Uh, for quite a while now, <laughs> I've been trying to get my head around the significance of Keith's pioneering multimedia work in the 1990s. His journey from traditional media, such as painting and sculpture, in early work such as reactionary suicide, Black Boys Keep Swinging, 1982, and The Body Politic, 1983. Um, kind of figurative painting, stroke, installation works. Um, to his embracing of the emerging technologies in groundbreaking projects like Relocating Remains, which I'm sure we'll talk a bit more about this evening. So I've been fascinated with this work, in a way, and this period, for two reasons. Firstly, Works like Relocating Remains, which was an exhibition, a CD-ROM, and a monograph, poses crucial questions in relation, and I think Keith might talk about that hopefully tonight, well, maybe, um, poses crucial questions in relation to how we make sense of the fragmented nature of history and the scattered remains of identity and subjectivity in the wake of such traumas of racial slavery in the Middle Passage as well as also highlighting, I think, the work, the ongoing democratic, democratic deficit of cultural memory and materials in our contemporary visual culture. But Keith's work, I think, poses this in a dialectical way by suggesting that technology and art making can provide resources and frameworks in which people can begin to remold and make sense of identity by creatively combining and redeploying the scattered remains of cultural materials in new and innovative ways. I'm sure Keith is going to refute that in a few seconds, but anyway. Secondly, I think the other way, I've also been trying to get my head around why Keith's work from this period 
though acknowledged in many quarters as pioneering um, internationally in many ways, is not really better known, in the, particularly in the UK. At six o'clock in the morning, I realised that I hadn't been to sleep yet. At seven o'clock this morning, my alarm clock went off. That's one hour sleep. And so therefore, the world is looking fuzzy. I'm not really functioning. Um, I'm noticing that in the audience are some of our greatest black minds of this moment, this Sunday voices. I'm just hoping that they will just give us an easy time. You know, because we're kind of in slow motion. Um, however, um, this whole thing um, basically co coincides with, what is that? Oh, it coincides with um, a kind of, a kind of broader project which I'm working on. Um, and in connection with that project, I've prepared some kind of rough, rough DVD sort of commentaries, which are quite short. However, they describe um, a number of projects which are of sort of interest to what I want to speak about this, e this evening. And so these are kind of two really short clips, and I'm hoping that I don't get it into too much trouble with them, Paul for kind of run, running over uh, for time. However, they describe a kind of project, um, or they, they describe two projects which I'm working on, which are connected, um, which kind of raise some of, the, some of the ideas and questions which I would like to consider. Um, so let me just see if I can just play the first one. If, and we might want to kill the lights. Is it? Robot bodies refers to an ongoing body of research dating from the first staging of an installation by the same name as part of Isaiah Revolution at the Blue Coat Gallery, Liverpool, in September 1998. This work was further developed during a period spent at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, USA, culminating in the second version of this interactive installation staged initially in April 2001. One of the key starting points for this project was Carol Chapek's 1920 stage play, Rossum's Universal Robots. In this work, Chapek famously deployed a term derived from the Czech term robota, meaning forced labor, to describe the mechanized members of an industrially fabricated slave class who stage a revolt against their human masters. This terror of an enslaved underclass and its potential for insurrection has formed a core theme in robot narratives throughout science fiction ever since. In this project, I argue that this terror of the mechanized other has often acted as a metaphor for racial difference, within which the mechanized otherness of the robot stands in for the physical otherness of the black body. Within this dichotomy between the machine as symbolic other and flesh as the symbolic norm, the android classically understood as the machine masquerading, sometimes covertly in human guise, and the cyborg depicted as the conjoined human-machine hybrid also occupy specific symbolic spaces within discourses around otherness, difference, and racial anxiety. Within the work, Robot Bodies, these three categories of mechanoid are encountered through an interactive interface featuring three constantly morphing bodies, allowing the user to explore notes on the dissection of a robot's body, notes on the dissection of an android's body, and notes on the dissection of a cyborg's body. Each category, revealing fragments of imagery from key science fiction films and texts upon which this project is based. Clicking on the body of the robot takes the viewer into an interactive space in which text and visual elements are revealed through a process of haptic interaction. For instance, the definition of the robot alongside the Czech origin of the term is referenced, alongside a clip from the 1956 movie Forbidden Planet in which the robot character Robbie is described. Robbie is simply a tool. Tremendously strong, of course, he could quite easily this house on Navigation buttons allow the user to progress through a series of interactive spaces. Within each space, a voice passage is activated, paralleling the robot alongside historical and societal frames of the black body, juxtaposed with further notes, texts, definitions, and images. Here, for instance, 
the explicit physical otherness of the robot is parallel to historical discourses around the explicit physical markers of racial difference. Those visible differences in the form of the entity are marked and impossible to ignore. The alien configuration of the robot is proposed, implying ways in which similar notions have been applied to the black body. In respect of their physical dimensions and fabric, they are entirely alien. In relationship to the assumed power and durability of both the robot and the black body, their physical power and durability is often unsurpassed. Exploring the suitability of both the black body and the robotic body to repetitive and demanding labor from the cotton fields to the surface of Mars. They are not susceptible to the normal rigors of fatigue. Internal or internal mechanisms has been proven less likely to adversely affect their functionality or to deter them from the completion of their program. And going on to further explore assumptions which have been historically applied to both the black body and the robot. They are more often than not benign and when furnished with a clearly defined set of instructions can be comfortably controlled. They can, however, on occasion fail to respond correctly to instruction, a fault often attributable to rogue influences within their programming. Each section of this work ends with the threat of reversion, a moment at which the other becomes a hazard, a core theme within anxieties around racial difference. Under these circumstances, the entity may display a tendency to revert, become unpredictable and present a hazard. In a similar way, we are invited into the space of the cyborg, in which the definition of the synthesis of the organic and the cybernetic, the integration of meat and metal, is introduced. Once again, a series of voice passages guides us through the work. We are reminded that the cyborg is part robotic, and therefore the inheritor of all the physical power and durability of the machine body. In their fabrication they are characterized by the integration of parts from a range of sources. In part they inherit all the qualities of physical strength, endurance and durability which the antecedents of those parts of their anatomies would suggest. We are also reminded that the cyborg is also part normative human. In other parts all of those qualities of judgment, self-reflection, and the operation of conscience are inherited. On happy occasions, the dual operation of these disparate elements creates an entity of formidable abilities. We get the best of both worlds. The fastest reflexes modern technology has to offer onboard computer-assisted memory and a lifetime of on-the-street law enforcement programming. It is my great pleasure to present to you Robocop. Robocop. At other moments, the blend becomes a tragic one. Part wars against part, struggling for dominance within the body of the entity. However, the cyborg is also seen as a split body within which the organic norm and the mechanic other are seen to be in conflict. This echoes the dilemma of the so-called tragic Malatu, in which the character is divided between racial identities which are characterized as incompatible. Once again, this creates anxieties around the threat of reversion and the terror of the entity becoming a hazard. Under these circumstances, the entity may display a tendency to revert, become unpredictable, presenting a hazard. Finally, Entering the android space, one is confronted with definitions around the android's human-like qualities which disguise its machine core. In its surface appearance, the entity is identical to us in all respects. But these are new. They look human. Sweat, bad breath, everything. Very hard to spot. It may through this subterfuge, we've undetected amongst us, using every means to synthesize a pattern of behavior identical to our normal functions. However, anxieties around the android focus around its covert agenda and its irrevocable coding potentially align it to an agenda of some alien other. It will, however, 
through its irrevocable coding, be subject to other loyalties antipathetic to the ones by which we govern. It will move amongst us using its invisibility to carry out its hostile agenda. It is only through an act of unmasking that the android is revealed to be an infiltrator. It is in fact the other engaged in an act of passing. It is masquerading as the norm. Only when exposed will it reveal its true malign identity. Once again, a scenario of terror and hazard is evoked. Only when exposed will it reveal its true malign Under these circumstances, the entity may display a tendency to revert, become unpredictable, and present a hazard. hazard. Now, I don't know how much of, you, of that you could make out because I've been, I've been handed um, a piece of paper which says that um, it never shows the full frame. In a sense, you needed to see um, the full frame of the piece. So I do apologise about that. Um, but I hope you actually got a sense of kind of how, how that interactive piece works. Um, I'm just going to quickly um, go down to the second piece. And I do apologise. This piece um, is in progress. Um, it's, it's a pretty short piece, um, and so it does contain huge holes, both technically, um, conceptually, theoretically, and in all other ways. Uh, um, but it's the, the beginning of a process. In the ongoing project Robot Bodies, I argue that the mechanised body has functioned as an allegorical standing for the racial other in a number of key science fiction texts. In code, I would like to further explore the proposed dichotomy between the organic norm and the machine other in relationship to the computer and the language, software and coding systems that are used to communicate with it. Classically within any first encounter with the other, a shared set of communicative codes need to be established. These are often constructed from a negotiated amalgamation of sounds, signs and gestures taken from the language systems of both parties and combine into a new language system, which is sometimes referred to as a patois. The expressions, we are say or we are say, can literally mean what are you saying or it can actually mean how are you doing. The same could be argued of the interaction between humans and computers. The space between the machine code within which computers conceptualise the world and human language systems needs to be bridged by an interlanguage or cyber patois that contains syntactic fragments from both language systems which, through a process of negotiation, are combined into a newly configured language system, a patois, which can be adopted, understood and employed by either party. In relation to this, I'm specifically interested in the historical development of a cyber patois called Lingo, which was originally developed by John Henry Thompson in 1988 to provide the interactive scripting environment for a multimedia authoring package called Macromind Director. Developed from an earlier software package called VideoWorks Interactive Pro, Director became the principal interactive authoring environment used by digital artists and designers in the construction of CD-ROMs, animations, games and interactive installations and environments throughout the 1990s and beyond. Many of the seminal digital and interactive artworks produced during this period had J.T. Thompson's Lingo engine at their core. In relationship to my own interactive work, such as Caught Like a Nigger in Cyberspace, Relocating the Remains, Robot Bodies, Ghosts in the Archive, and a future museum of the present were all produced using director and lingo. The debt which all of us owe to J.T. Thompson's pioneering work on lingo is therefore vast. John Henry Thompson was born in Hackney, London in 1959 to Jamaican parents. Moving back to Jamaica at the age of one, he returned to live in Essex at the age of five until at the age of 12 his family moved to Brooklyn, New York. In 1983, Thompson earned a degree from MIT where he majored in computer science with a minor in visual arts. 
He was able to continue as a technical instructor at MIT, developing systems for the Visual Language Workshop, a space in which he was able to expand his interest in marrying visual things with computers. In 1987, he joined Macromind as one of their then team of six engineers, developing a number of projects, including his groundbreaking work on the Lingo scripting engine for Director. He continued as principal engineer until he left the company in 2001. My name is John Henry Thompson. And you're the internationally renowned Jamaican computer scientist. That's what they say. And the inventor of the Lingo scripting language. Correct, yes. Could you tell me what, what Lingo is exactly? Yes. Lingo is the scripting language in a product called Macromedia Director, now called Adobe Director. Uh, a scripting language is the way people get the application to do what they, they want it to do, developers, programmers. So I created a language specifically designed for it to be easy to, easy to use uh, for people, for programmers and people that are just coming to programming. My argument is that in 1988, Lingo represented a revolutionary development in computer scripting, which was based not only on Thompson's long established knowledge of existing programming languages, dating back to his work as a schoolboy with BASIC, Fortran and COBOL, but also on what I would argue to be a radical adaptation of black or ebonic speech patterns in which words become objects or containers for meaning which can shift in relationship to context. Thompson himself was most proud of Lingo's at the time groundbreaking ability for a variable to hold any value. This, I would argue, links it directly to strategies of encoding within black speech, where the meaning assigned to a term can be strategically shifted and renegotiated in relationship to the context in which that speech is being used and who may be listening. This opens a complex relationship with ideas explored by Henry Louis Gates around black speech in his classic study, The Signifying Monkey, a theory of African-American literary criticism in which the strategic deployment of linguistic encoding and double talk is scrutinized. This strategic use of signification and encoding against the political backdrop of 1970s America is articulated with characteristic elegance by Gil Scott Heron in his 1978 live recording, The Ghetto Code. CIA and FBI noses pressed against our window pane, ears glued to our telephone. Why won't they leave us alone? trying to pick up on the ghetto code. Old-fashioned ghetto code, you remember, you used to jump on the telephone and say, hey, Briz, other me, Ann, how you feel, Zia? <laughs> is everything all real, all right? Well, why don't you, uh, why don't you tell me about this PSI that Nia's at? You going? Briz, I don't, why don't you bring me a Nia that could be his ass? Yeah, and if you get back to Steers, oh, why don't you bring me some Briz, and Briz, who's like Briz, oh, that is up? I appreciate it. I know whoever it was, they was paying to listen in on my phone, had to be saying, well, dot, dot, did it, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> Damn, if I know. Or, to conclude this section, ideas around sonic encoding, with their probable roots stretching back to the talking drum of Yoruba culture, is here replayed to comic effect by Will Smith and Biz Markey in this scene from the 2001 sequel, Men in Black 2, directed by Barry Sonnefield. It is the examination of this sometimes trickster-esque and sometimes strategic use of linguistic and sonic encoding within black speech and its parallels with the negotiation of shared meaning with the machine other as seen within lingo and other cyber ebonic language systems which I wish to explore further within this project. <clears throat> okay, so my name is Gary Stewart. I'm um, a artist and um, multimedia designer. And um, my particular involvement with this project has been um, an invitation to look at the period, particularly from the mid-90s to about 2005, 
the period which, um, where there was a huge explosion of um, kind of like um, new media around contemporary arts. And, um, and to particularly look at the way that um, those early pioneering artists who were looking at um, the emergence of the, um, the World Wide Web and internet art in around 96, how they worked with um, designers and other people in terms of realizing and translating their work from physical kind of like um, work to the virtual um, internet space. And um, in particular, I've been invited to talk about the period when I was um, head of multimedia at um, a place called Innova, which is the Institute of International Visual Arts. And this um, um, organization, um, along with exhibitions, publications, research and education, was one of the pioneers of um, kind of developing a space for artists to develop work on the internet. Okay, so Liminal was um, a, a project which um, was curated in 2009. Um, and it really was about looking at this question of um, the city, technology, networks, and cultural diversity. And um, let's see. I want to, in particular, I'm going to end by just simply showing, well, or talking about one of the pieces of work called Frictions of Distance, which was, um, I mean, it was difficult choosing this project. There were, I'm really I'm quite proud of um, the project in terms of um, the artists who contributed to this, but I just thought, you know, let's end on this one, um, which is a telemedia project. So it's um, a connection created between Riverton Place in, um, in Old Street and the um, French Cultural Embassy in Cambodia. And uh, these two artists um, created this link which enabled um, people to see the respective footsteps and presence of people at the other side, okay? And these, um, these kind of graphics here were embedded with information and data um, and shared between the two sites. I'll just um, perhaps just play this bit here. <laughs> Interesting. That's interesting because, um, in a sense, uh, um, they were, well, sort of the beginning and end of a process. I mean, they are works which are 
which are connected in that um, they both try to use interactivity as a way of organizing content. So um, you're, you're attempting to kind of set up a space in which the user can, can access different kinds of content through going through different pathways. And so, and so it's using interactivity as a way of, 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 of um, organizing that kind of process. Um, I think um, quite soon after doing the Robot Bodies piece, I keep on calling call it um, a work in progress. So in fact, it's been a work in progress for the past 15 years, which was really scary when I saw the, the date of the original work. Um, and in a sense, that was all, it's a piece which also coincided with my, my loss of, of kind of optimism about, about gallery-based interactivity about placing some kind of um, interactive device within the gallery for audiences to interact with. And, 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 and that was sort of one of the last works which I, which I did which actually explored that, which actually used that. And, and there are reasons for that. You know, there are reasons, um, you know, I've become quite disillusioned with the idea of the click frenzy, that when people are confronted with the ability to interact with something. It's just about the interactivity as opposed to about the content. So people just <laughs> click a lot, but don't give time to actually, to actually listen or absorb something. Whereas, you know, in video, linear video, you sit, you watch, you, you take stuff in. And so in a sense, it's interesting to just pose those two pieces, because Robot Bodies really was one of the last times that I wanted to use interactivity in that way. If that makes sense. Okay, I think we've been, there's so many things that we can talk, talk about and there's so many questions I'm sure you want to ask. So let me just quickly open it up to anyone in the audience want to perhaps put your hand up. Just come out at the back there. Paul, earlier you, you mentioned, um, people might know that a lot of my work is as a painter. And I heard Paul was uh, mentioning earlier about outmoded works of art. I don't know if he was talking about me, but... <laughs> but um, I am actually quite a tech savvy person and um, I've made sort of I'll, work I'll in. I'll take a position. I wasn't yeah. saying that, but I think that would be worse now. No, this is really a, a question for Keith, actually, because I've made work in um, all kinds of media, including website and video and stuff. And I think of myself as being quite kind of tech savvy, and, you know, even though I am almost a pensioner. <laughs> but <laughs> I, I bought the book, Relocating the Remains, a few years ago. And as you know, it's got a CD-ROM, and probably some of the younger people in the audience will have never heard of a CD-ROM, they don't know what it is. But it is actually supposedly a very advanced piece of technology. And I put it into my sort of fairly new um, CD-ROM player the other day, and it kind of almost broke it. Yeah. And so <laughs> I wanted to know, uh, um, from your perspective, what you think about the question of obsolescence in digital artworks, because um, you know, there is this problem, isn't there, of works which you can make in a particular format, and then a few years later, we can't see them, because I can't see the relocating the remains um, interactive CD-ROM, because it just won't work in the current um, sort of yeah, yeah. latest technology. Well, lessons is a massive, massive issue with work made between, I mean, there is actually, you know, um, it's like the mid or the... Uh, 90s, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. Often people giving talks about, about having a mountain of sidequest drives in their studios. I don't know if anybody knows about the sidequest drive. It was a way in, in, in which work was stored, you know, in the 80s. And there is no way of reading a sidequest drive now. So all of this work, and I have in, in my attic um, a box or boxes of Cyquist drives, you know, with work on, which there's no way I can access. You know, and there are other, there are other things like, like that, other drive types, which, you know, everything which is on them is, is impossible to access, unless you find somebody with, who's kept alive some machine where you can transfer. So this is a massive, there's a massive gap just in terms of the archive of work because there's so much which can't, which can't be accessed. 
I mean, um, the other thing would be things like, you know, all of those, all of those, all those CD-ROMs, the CD-ROMs which I showed, the anti-ROM, the whatever, all those ones, you know, there's almost this built-in obsolescence. And it's, you know, most on the Mac, isn't it? Because, because Apple is so, is so ruthless in terms of just Market pushing, budget. yeah, yeah, pushing new operating systems which basically break anything which was made on the older operating system. You know, it's not as grim as I thought it was in terms of relocating the remains and other things because I think, you know, they can be rebuilt to run on, on current tech tech, eh, eh, oh, apologies, but you're absolutely right. There is this built-in obsolescence and it is a massive issue. What's interesting about relocating the remains project is that what principally remains of it is the book, which is a very ancient technology. Mm -hmm. uh, that is the, and that's how I, for example, uh, mm. really got into that project. I mean, there, are, there is a kind of archive of the project on the Inver website, which you can kind of look at. But the, the, the principal outcome, output from the project, which you know, was a very fine input at the time, is actually a book. I'm Carol Dixon, Sheffield University. Uh, I just wanted to ask about audiencing, because um, Keith, you mentioned that you were sometimes a little disillusioned about the gallery space for showing certain work. And I wondered whether, um, as artists, the two of you had thought about how you want your work to be shown now in the digital age. Are you, are you producing for screen, or are you producing for bigger projections, or for gallery spaces? How do you think about the audiencing of your work? Briefly, I'll just say, um, um, audiences are, I think about audiences um, implicitly in the work itself. I mean, um, but that's because <laughs> you didn't see any, I didn't show any of my work, but um, that's because the type of work that I create, um, the audience um, there, I don't want to use their interaction. I don't want to use the word interaction. They, the dynamic of the, um, the way that the audience is implicated in the work itself is an important part of the way it's received. You see what I mean? And that's both for the work with um, Trevor Madison, I do this double morphology, and the work that I do at um, Queen Mary in Brazil, if you see what I mean. Um, that isn't to say that I make the pieces of work with the audiences in mind but rather that um, it's constructed in such a way that the dynamic changes and it, um, as a consequence of their kind of um, involvement in the piece itself. Okay, well, I'd like to round up there. Just to say that the Ghost Project is an ongoing project. We'll be looking at, I'll be looking at more works, more artists, um, and there'll be other events. So please keep an eye on the UAL website for updates on that and also on Facebook. But I'd like to thank you all for coming tonight and braving the weather um, and finding this space. And also, of course, to Keith Piper and Gary Stewart for the contribution. <laughs>